Thank you everybody for being here. This is a presentation made by me from Verify. I'm a Verify co-founder and CEO now. Uh, I'm more, I was initially more part of the research team of Verify with Tristan and Macek, uh, but we've evolved since then. We now have a product, a website. You can consult um, and log, create an account. It's actually pretty easy. You can uh, log in, create an account with Google, and you can uh, deposit funds and buy Bitcoin, send directly to your wallet, uh, really any amount you want. Also, we have a phone line. You can call in the chat within the website and we answer pretty quickly to help you with your questions. If you have any questions regarding the service or other related services, such as helping you secure your Bitcoins with harder wallets and other type of security, you can contact us or you can go on our fees page to see how much we charge. We'll be going through some changes, dropping our fees, making the product more interesting, more secure as well. So if you have any thoughts, any suggestions, anything you'd like to see, let us know. We're active developers on the team and we have uh, the ambition to make the best product for Canadians and Quebecois. So Taproot, we'll be going through First of all, UTXOs and signatures, which are basically the current Bitcoin technologies. Then we'll talk about the addresses types, uh, the current addresses types, and then we'll talk about Taproot. But before Taproot, we have to talk about Schnorr, Mass, which are kind of included in the Taproot type of uh, upgrade. Uh, they're just, let's say, hidden under Taproot, but they're still a part of the puzzle. And finally, we'll talk about the activation, which is actually a bit controversial. There's the speedy trial, which is what's going on now. And some people say a second Bitcoin civil war will happen. So um, we'll talk about that a little bit more at the end. But basically, uh, the activation is a complex process because uh, how do you call every Bitcoin user and ask them what they think? You can't. So first of all, we're gonna talk about Bitcoin signatures and UTXOs. So a Bitcoin, when it moves, uh, it moves as a dollar bill that I give to you. Uh, it doesn't move as a banking transaction that goes like from my bank account to your bank account. It moves as a unit that goes from me to you. Uh, and that unit is called a coin, also called a UTXO as unspent transaction output. Um, so whenever I send, let's say, coins to my friend Tristan, and I send him 0.1 Bitcoin, I can send him 0.1 as a coin worth 0.1, or I can send him 0.1 as 10 coins worth each 0.01, and that would be the transaction. So that's um, a, a UTXO, unspent transaction output, is just really a coin uh, that you can see. It's just really a coin uh, that makes the total, totality of the Bitcoins. And each coin associated has a script or like a condition on how it can be spent. For example, when I send 0.1 Bitcoin to my friend Tristan, the condition that he can spend those that coin is included in the Bitcoin address he sent to me. So if he sends to me a Bitcoin address, which the conditions associated to spending that coin is uh, just sign it with a private key, then it's as simple as that. Then it's as simple as me sending Bitcoin to an address uh, Tristan provided Tristan having that UTXO, that coin, and once he wants to spend it, he just proves to the network he holds the private key associated to that coin, and it's as simple as that. And he makes a signature which proves that he possesses the private key without revealing the private key, right? Because if he reveals the private key, then anybody could go and just take control of that address, if there's any other UTXOs that are within the same conditions, well, they could just steal that money. So the signature is an algorithm that allows you 
to prove to the network that you own a private key without exposing that private key and thus matching the conditions associated to the coin you received. But that's for the simple scenario, which is the I send Bitcoins to you and you sign it with a private key and you can move those coins away. There's other types of Bitcoin transactions as, we, as we've seen until, uh, so far. So for example, let's say I go on blockstream.info, which is one of the best explorers out there. And I go and select transactions and grab this random transaction. We'll see what it is. This is a paid to script. This is a different transaction. So even though um, I sent Bitcoin to an address, the address could, doesn't necessarily represent just a private key. In the first case that I showed, it did. So let me find another transaction. So you see right here, this address starts with one. This means that this address follows the conditions that I talked about earlier, which were you only need a private key to spend from that. That's the, the, the only thing you need. And the difference is uh, with the one I just showed before, um, like maybe I'll just grab a random one again, that one that starts with three or once we start with BC1, I'll explain that difference. Now. So basically uh, there's three types of Bitcoin address or Bitcoin transaction. There is the one which I said, you pay one signer, they sign, they can move the coins away from that. And that's all the transactions that start with one. Then there's the pay to script hash. People were like, if you can pay someone, uh, why can't you pay a script? Why, why can't we put a set of rules? For example, um, you need five signers out of these 10 signers. Out of these 10 public keys, you need five private keys corresponding to five public keys to be signed at, and that's gonna be what allows the transaction to move. Uh, and that's a pay to script hatch. It's just a complex form of script. We can call it a smart contract or other things uh, that have more complex Bitcoin transactions, such as a multi-signature contract where many people can own Bitcoin together and it needs many people to move that Bitcoin. Or it can be a lightning network transaction which is a second layer of Bitcoin that allows for immediate transactions, or it can be a sidechain transaction, which is another form of layer that allows more privacy, for example. So really a pay to script hash is the door to uh, setting more complex smart contracts. Uh, however, there's limitations. First of all, there's a size limitation. Second, you cannot put like infinite conditions. Like uh, I, it can either be redeemed one year from now. Uh, it cannot be redeemed before one year from now. After one year, it can be redeemed either by me alone or by three other people. Uh, you can say that, but it cannot be like so, so long uh, because of the size limitations. And also it's once you have, once you want to move the coins away, let's say I send Bitcoin to a transaction that starts with, with a, to an address that starts with a tree, a pay to script hash. Once the person who owns that address wants to move the coins away from there, they have to reveal to the whole network, the whole set of, or the whole script, the whole set of conditions. Even if, let's say there were 10 conditions and one was executed, the simplest form one, they would still have to reveal to the network the whole script because that's, that's what was hashed. And the network has to match the address, the script hash to the script uh, to prove it's the same transaction and it's valid. And the signature corresponds to the script. So you let's say you do one condition and all your other conditions are revealed. So it's not so good for privacy.
Uh, and then they're just SegWit. SegWit isn't a new type of transaction. It's an optimization that sends the signature, which is the biggest part of a transaction. Uh, it's just a whole bunch of numbers and, and letters. It just sends it to a different area of the transaction, thus segregating it. And it allows for some size optimization uh, and some fee optimization. And those SegWit transactions start with a BC1. And that's, let's say, what we just saw before. But we got to be careful because, like someone just said on the chat, SegWit transactions can also start with a tree. Why? Because a pay to script hash, a script, can represent anything. You can do a multi sig, but you can also do a set with in a script because a script is kind of like some code. So you can do a set with straight or, or like directly set with native that starts with BC1, or you can code a set with transaction with a pay to script hash transaction. And thus, that's a set with nest transaction. And so that's important to keep in mind. Uh, so these are the, the address types so far. Uh, and then people have discovered uh, a technology that's called Schnorr Signatures about a couple of years ago that it's an improvement to the signature algorithm that is currently used, ECDSA, or elliptic curved digital signature algorithm, in a few ways. So the first way, it's the more scalable. It's Due to its simplicity, it's 25% smaller in size. So that's cool, but it's not, let's say, a huge change or a huge motivation to, to insert it in the Bitcoin network. But it's still nice. So then uh, it's not malleable. You could change a transaction. Like once you change any piece of a transaction, it invalidates the signature. And ECDSA, it's technically possible to change something and the signature still works. Nothing very important, like you cannot change the amount, uh, you cannot change the address destination and the signature is still valid, but you could change a few random conditions. And honestly, it's not so very dangerous. It has been explored. That wasn't the motivation to have, to add Schnorr. Actually, the main interesting point about Schnorr is signature aggregation. And remember, like I said earlier, that we can do multi-signature contracts with Bitcoin, thus allowing many people to own a specific Bitcoin together and without the agreement of everyone that Bitcoin cannot move. Well, Schnorr actually has it in an intrinsic manner. Schnorr signatures can aggregate between themselves without the Bitcoin multi-signature protocol. It's just, it just works. As the uh, image shows here, uh, you can just combine hash, basically, many short signatures together into one signature. And you can basically prove that all three signatures were required to produce that combination, that aggregation of signatures. Uh, and, and thus, uh, someone um, would, would trust you, basically. But actually, the person, uh, nobody has to know uh, there were three signatures. Someone could just see the aggregation of the three signatures. It looks like a normal signature. They don't know three people signed to create it but they do know uh, it, it, it proves that the pri a private key was owned because that's what a signature is for, right? To prove that you own a private key or a secret, right? Uh, a combination of private keys in the aggregation case, but without the network knowing three people were signing. And that's the big difference, basically. With EDS, ECDSA, if we do a multi-sig and it's a 10 out of 15, the network, once we reveal the pay to script hash script to redeem those coins and move them somewhere else, everyone in the network is going to see it's a 10 
out of 15. And they're gonna see each, uh, each public key of each key use in that script, the 15 public keys. And they're gonna see the 10 signatures that prove that 10 out of 15 agreed to move those coins. But in Schnorr's case, you wouldn't, first of all, the network wouldn't ever know it was a 10 out of 15 it, because they would just see the aggregate signature, the final stage, which basically looks like one signature. So it becomes off chain, the multi signature scheme. It just becomes something that I can agree with my friends without sharing it to the network rather than it being shared as default with paid script hash with the current multi-signature scheme. So that's interesting. And that's what people are looking forward with Schnorr signatures and the Taproot implementation. But Schnorr signatures is not implemented just like that. It's implemented within the Taproot proposal, which I'll get there in a second. And then there's the concept of MAST, Merkleized Abstract Syntax Trees which is also necessary to understand Taproot. So the problem with, like I said, pay to script hash is you have to reveal the whole script with all its conditions, even the ones that weren't executed because the whole script is hash, right? So to prove that a hash, which is what is initially shared, a pay to script hash, is to prove that that hash corresponds to that script to those rules, to that signature, you have to reveal the whole script. And it just, like I said, you can execute one condition and you have to reveal the other 10 conditions, let's say you have. MAST allows for individual condition hashing and all set within a Merkle tree. That means that instead of writing the script in 10 lines and hashing those 10 lines together, and uploading that hash to the network, you would hash each condition separately and then create a Merkle root. So let's say an aggregation of those hashes rather than hash them all together. So it means that you could then, once one, one of the condition is executed, only that condition is revealed and you can hash that condition that was revealed, get the Merkle hash that I said was initially individually condition hashed. You can get that hash with that condition and you can then verify that that hash was part of the aggregation of the Merkle root or the Merkle tree rather than reveal every other hash, you can just reveal one and check that it's part of the root. Maybe I can show an image of what a Merkle tree looks like. So that it's clear. So here you see that a Merkle root uh, is what it is. You can see that uh, let's say there's information and uh, within each box and it all creates a hash. And then you see that the top hash that's on top of, let's say, these two hashes, 0, 0, and 0, 1, there's the hash 0. You could, with the hash 0, 0, you could check that it's part of the hash 0 without the other hash. As you can check that the hash zero is part of the top hash without the hash one. So you don't need every other hash to check that a hash is part of the top hash. And that's basically what must, must does, is you don't need the hashes of the other individual conditions because you can just check that the condition, the hash of the condition you want to share, you want to, to execute, is part of the Merkle, of the top hash, which is called the Merkle root, this top hash right here. So I can check that the hash zero, zero 
is part of the top hash without any of the other hashes. And I can prove through the network that this is a valid transaction because my condition was part of that top hash of that masked transaction, thus saving myself from revealing the other conditions and they would remain private forever. And that's what the difference of mass between between masked and a pay to script hash is. You only reveal the conditions you execute. All the other ones remain private forever. They remain simple. They, they, they're never exposed because it, you just see a Merkle root and the Merkle hash of the condition you execute. And you can verify that the Merkle hash of the condition you executed is part of the Merkle root of the top hash. So I know it's a lot and we can jump in questions later and we can review all this later, but I, I'll be going forward. So now Taproot. So Taproot is the hashing of a masked Merkle root, which includes basically all, like let's say 10 conditions. It's a, with a public key. So you would see on this image, public key, script, compute, the first, just under assumptions, you would see public key, script together, create something called a tweak public key, basically a taproot transaction. Uh, and the public key, what is it? It's, it's really just a random piece of information that allows you to hide a mast. Because the, the thing is, when you do a mast, and you just expose a Merkle root, even if you don't share the conditions that would never get executed and you only share one out of 10, everybody knows you're hiding something, right? You're hiding a complex set of conditions because you, you have a masked Merkle root. And it's very different from a pay to script hash or a pay to public key hash transaction. Everybody knows you're doing a masked. But what Taproot allows is it combines the masked Merkle root called script within the image with a public key, a random public key, and you get a tweak public key or a Taproot transaction. And that tweak public key really looks like a pay to public key hash. It looks like the simplest form of Bitcoin transaction, thus allowing you to hide a super complex private Bitcoin transaction amassed with conditions you will never expose, but the people would still know you have a complex script into a taproot transaction that looks like the most basic form of transactions. And basically, since any Bitcoin transaction can be a script or a public key, because it's either pay to script hash, pay to public key hash, because the Segway transactions are still either pay to script hashes or pay to public key hashes. And since either transaction is that, every Bitcoin transaction can be a taproot transaction and look exa exactly identical. And that's what we're looking after. It's the fact that in five, 10 years from now, when Taproot is completely implemented, I would have 25 conditions hidden in a mast plus hidden in a Taproot. And you would just send coins to your friend in the simplest form of transaction as a pay to public key hash. But because they're computed as Taproot transactions, they would look the exact same at first. Then, I, you would reveal the public key and prove that it was a paid to public key hash. I would only reveal one of the conditions. And maybe the condition I reveal is a paid to public key hash. And nobody will ever know that actually all my 15 other conditions were like extremely complex and had a lot of information that I keep private finally. Um, we think that public key that is used to hide the script and create a tweak public key or a taproot transaction, it's a 
sh hides a schnorr. Uh, you can you can do a schnorr signature, a sh signature aggregation scheme actually with that public key. So basically, you can do a multisig within that public key of 100 out of 300 users. And you wouldn't, you don't even need to hide that within the script or the mast because we're using Schnorr. And if you remember, Schnorr has signature aggregation. So it has intrinsic off-chain multi-signature without scalability limits, thus allowing someone to not even use the mast, the script part of Taproot, just simply using the pay to public key hash, very simple part, and still doing a very complex multi-signature scheme with signature aggregation by Schnorr signatures. So it gives another option. It's not just about hiding the mast and making it identical to other public key. It's also about introducing Schnorr signatures with the public key and uh, allowing for signature aggregation and everything else. And basically every transaction becomes a Schnorr signature. But every transaction can be signed with a Schnorr signature because it uses the public key at the end. So every transaction is really uh, a Schnorr signature, thus saving 25% in size, thus being non-malleable and thus being subject to signature aggregation if desired. Uh, so there's a lot of things going on here. Mast, Schnorr, signature aggregation, size optimization, non-malleability, privacy with mast, privacy not only with mast, but your mast is private because it's tweaked with a public key and looks identical as a pay to public key hash. Well, a taproot pay to public key hash, also known as a pay to taproot, uh, which is not the same address type as a pay to public key hash, but it's still a public key that hides the script or everything else within that transaction. So it's a new format of public key hash called pay to taproot. And that's basically it. There is no distinction between any Bitcoin transaction since any script can be hidden in a mask and every pay to public key hash can use the default state without the mask. Um, and that's basically what Taproot is. Uh, well, we can go and maybe I can show you um, what a Taproot address will look like. You'll see it's very different from a standard pay to public key hash. Uh, and there's people that have already started playing with it, given that uh, it's like the code is out there. It's just not part of the Bitcoin network yet. We can already start coding and diving deep into it. There's a lot of information to be read about that as well. Uh, and that's uh, what people are doing right now, trying to explore the furthest extent of, uh, let me find one that shows what a pay to taproot transaction will look like. It's gonna be very similar as a, um, how do I say this? A SegWit transaction, a SegWit native transaction. Um, and by the way, there's also negative sides too everything that I described, that's maybe uh, a little bit further down the road, a little bit harder to understand. Um, okay, so it doesn't seem like many people are sharing um, the, what the pay to tap root transaction looks like. Maybe it's within this one, uh, but it basically starts with a B2 and it looks very similar uh, as, um, uh, segue transaction. So now we can talk about the activation. If, does anybody recognize this? This is a set of blocks. This is actually all the latest blocks on the network. 
And uh, you can find them on a website called taproot.watch. It's basically what is tracking, a website that is tracking every Bitcoin block and whether they're signaling for Taproot or they're just not signaling that they're for Taproot. And every red square here represents a block, uh, an update to the Bitcoin blockchain, to the Bitcoin history of transactions that happens, a block is, happens every 10 minutes approximately and includes a bunch of transactions. So here you see all of the latest blocks and each block is mined by a miner. The miner the fan, the finds the, the answer to the to the mining question and thus claims the new Bitcoin and the Bitcoin fees of that block. Uh, but anyways, here every any every square represents a block, and every red block represents a miner who hasn't signaled that he's for taproot, and every green one represents one that he's that is for. So you see at first. Nobody was signaling because, uh, let's say, they just didn't update their software to signal. But then a few started to signal, and now a lot are starting to signal. It kind of looks like it's half to half. Uh, what's going to happen is we're going to go through something called a speedy trial. Um, it's just a name given by the devs for the this activation method. And there has been months of discussion on what should be the approach. And it has ended up being that we'll give miners uh, the possibility to signal that they're for taproot, and that's going to be the activation method. Because developers consider that it's important to get miners on board, which is, as users, we should consider what miners have to say because at the end, they make the blocks. If they're not for Taproot, uh, if they haven't upgraded their software yet, well, how can we really make Taproot a reality if the miners haven't updated their software to Taproot? So one theory is that if 90% of miners signal for Taproot, this means the network is ready and thus we should activate it. 90% within a two-week period. So you probably know that Bitcoin difficulty of ha of mining changes every two weeks. You probably saw on the news like a couple of weeks ago, uh, like 30% of miners uh, from China went offline and it made the hash rate drop massively. So, and, and that was just like within a day, but every two weeks, the network calculates its hash rate and changes the difficulty of mining a block. At first, you could mine a block with a laptop, and that's what people did. Now, to mine a block, you need hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of equipment in a warehouse with a lot of electricity. It's, it's, it's gotten much harder. The difficulty has increased a lot. So anyways, Every two weeks, there's an adjustment in difficulty. And that two week period, which has the same difficulty, if 90% of miners, of blocks mined by miners, signal for taproot, then taproot is considered activated. And this is the first two week period. And we see that 34% have signaled. So we're very far from, from it. This period is obviously not gonna work. But you see, it's still picking up. And the, the speedy trial means that we're going to give miners until August. We're going to give them three months, a little bit more than three months, almost four months, so that they can signal taproot more than 90% of the blocks within a two week period, and thus activate it in that collaborative effort, which was kind of the goal of Bitcoin core developers saying we have to be collaborative with miners. We want to be Pacific. We want to have a good conversation uh, rather than a fight. What happens if they don't do it? Uh, if they just don't do it, what happens if they decide oh, they don't want to do it uh, and August comes by and Taproot still hasn't activated because 
not more than 90%, let's say 85% they're signaling. So Tapper doesn't activate. A speedy trial means that we can then do a UA set. The, the speed trial is over. We gave the miners the opportunity, signal, they didn't do it. Now we can activate it as users. And that's what a user activated software is. It's just nodes signaling or just upgrading the software to Taproot. And with good communication, with good user efforts, we can just upgrade the network by the users without any central authority just some people writing code and making it secure and allowing any user to run it we can activate taproot as a us with usf user activated software like segwit was kind of done and that's when the question of the second bitcoin civil war jumps in which i was mentioning at, at first it's like francis Puglia says which he's in the camp i can't the speedy trial against the collaborative effort with miners because segwit kind of went like this they wanted to miners to activate and they didn't miners didn't activate miners played with the network they were ready to activate they just didn't do it because maybe they were trading bitcoin so if they don't activate it the bitcoin price drops then they can short Bitcoin and they know it's going to drop because they're not going to activate it. Or then they can, oh, they're going to signal 99%. Then the Bitcoin price goes up because it means the update's going to happen. So they long and then they short, you know, so there can be a lot of financial manipulation going on here. Uh, that's one of the, let's say, motives uh, miners wouldn't signal. There can be many other motivations and that was seen with segwit it, it didn't work this approach didn't work uh then shaolin fry an anonymous bitcoin user developed uh the bitcoin usf software it was basically the same bitcoin core software but with usf integrated and he disappeared after releasing that and USF was run by thousands of users. And at the end, when miners saw that USF was gonna happen, they're like, okay, we'll signal and we'll just get it over. So basically users forced miners to stop playing and just signal and just activate segment. But it still came down, it took months. It was very competitive, very conflictive and uh, it wasn't very productive and it just showed that miners are businesses they can run nodes they can be users the fact that they're mining is a separate part of the protocol it's not the user part so anyways those disagreements in this principle he says it is absolutely he was he's the ceo of bullbitcoin.com one of the uh, biggest websites to buy bitcoin in canada and uh, he's just been one of the most influential individuals in Canada for Bitcoin. So he says, it is absolutely critical that Core does not activate Taproot with lot equals false. That means uh, spirit trial. Lot equals, lot equals true is USF. Lot equals false is not USF minor activation. And he says, USF, no 2x, no 2x is... Uh, second part i won't get into that but it's the second part of the civil war which was also won by bitcoin users and actually no 2x is the last tentative of those miners ceos and those big business bitcoin companies trying to overtake bitcoin because that's another motivation it's not only about trading it's not only about uh, um it's it's about power it's about being able to dominate the network and decide what happens or what doesn't. So the second effort that these groups, corporative groups, we can call it, corporatist groups, tried to do to overtake the network was no 2X, uh, SegWit 2X, and it failed. And once it failed, that's when Bitcoin went to 20,000 because investors, the network, many could see that, yeah, Bitcoin does work. Miners couldn't overtake the network 
big business couldn't overtake the network. They tried many times and they failed. And they tried with a lot of money and they failed. And that's when Bitcoin went to 20,000. And we all know that story. So in this way, she says, USF no 2X PTSD is real. The only rational for lot equals false is being scared to offend the minors. Men say that. It establishes a president, a president. Minors bullying devs gets you what you want. Better no soft forks than this. So he says, it's better not to upgrade to that route than to do it by the lead of minors because that just gives them more power. It allows them to block it. It allows them to uh, get leverage to say, okay, we're gonna adopt, activate it, but we want something else. We want more power. And the developers of Bitcoin Core are, uh, they don't want to get in conflict, it's not their job at the end of the day, uh, but there's still a lot of uh, questions to, to, to ask ourselves, you know, and that's what the potential second Bitcoin Civil War would be. I don't think it's going to happen, but what happens if miners block the activation and users still want it, it could happen. So many are concerned with the speed trial approach, projecting similarities with the SegWit activation. People like Francis Spulia say, uh, Bitcoin Core devs haven't, let's say, under, uh, don't remember what happened or are simply just hoping for the best. And that's why they're giving miners a chance. Some people say, ah, oh, miners have learned the lesson. They won't uh, play the network because they know they will lose ultimately. So it's very tricky a situation. Um, so we'll say, I, I think I'm on the side of uh, a USF directly could have worked. You know, I don't think this is gonna fail necessarily, but it could, it, it does have a chance of miners just blocking it for control or for profit. Uh, so we'll see what happens. We're gonna know in August or before but as soon as August hits and Staproot hasn't been activated, it's gonna get way more complicated with a USF and some people saying, no, it's not gonna work. Miners thinking they're just taken out of the decision. So uh, preparing something from their side, we'll see, we'll see. But the last time it got pretty nasty. So that's pretty much it. Um, if you have any questions, I'll take them now. Any comments, anything you didn't understand, or simply, like I said, thoughts, memes, whatever. So uh, I'll mute myself, and if anybody wants to jump in on the chat, or, uh, well, I'll read the chat first, actually, and then if anybody wants to jump in on the mic, they can. So uh, someone asks, is Taproot support signaled by the mining ring itself or by the mining pool? It's signaled by the mining pool. So when you have a mining rig, you have no control over what's being signaled by your miners because you're giving the hash rate of your miners to the mining pool and the mining pool is running, is uploading the blocks or running a node that's connected to the network that signals, uh, actually writing the block because the signaling is within the block that was written. So no, you don't have any control over that. Um, okay, so some people were talking about that. Still not clear what a type of transaction looks like. It will start with a one. No, it will start with a B. Um, it will look very similarly as a segue transaction. It's going to look very different as other standards of transaction right now. And actually, it's it's very good that you mentioned that because that's what slush pool was explaining in the taproot uh, text. Basically, that taproot adds privacy, but it's also bad for privacy at first. Because if only, because when taproot begins, not a lot of people are going to use it. It's, it's not going to be ready to use in wallets. It's just going to be part of the protocol. It's going to be implemented in wallets later. Uh, in exchanges later. So at first, every people that are using Taproot are gonna be a small part of the network. And you're gonna see that, ah, those are Taproot transactions. So they're probably hiding a mast. 
they're probably doing signature aggregation. And you won't gain that privacy, but over time, 10, 20 years from now, when every Bitcoin transaction is a tap group one, then you'll gain the privacy. But at first, absolutely not, because it's gonna look very different from existent protocols as pay to script hash or pay to public key hash. Mm. Brandon says, say, for example, you had a large amount of UTXOs in a wallet. Currently, spending a large amount of UTXOs can get very expensive since each UTXO needs to be signed. Could the signature aggregation property of Snow signatures allow for a single signature to sign all of the UTXOs being spent? This is a great question. Okay, so this is actually called cross input signature aggregation. It is uh, a potential Bitcoin privacy technology, but it won't come as part of this update. Unfortunately, uh, I, I, and I spoke about this with Andrew Polstra, part of the director of research at Blockstream, and he told me that it, it is unfortunate, but there's, there's just no implementation yet of cross input signature aggregation that is extremely secure. And that was his concern, thus uh, it's not gonna be part of this upgrade, but who knows, maybe eventually. Um, so Pernell asked, does the green block mean, A, the miners of the block upgraded their software and can theoretically use the Taproot tech, two, they're using the new Taproot technology, three, they can use Taproot to mine for some transactions and use another technology to mine other transactions. Actually, it doesn't mean to any of those three. It could mean A. Uh, we don't know because the Taproot code is available. But the green block really means that they have signal, they have just written, we agree about Taproot. We, we want Taproot to be part of the network. That's really what it means. It doesn't mean they're, they can run it, they're using it. Nobody can use it. It's not part of the protocol. If they would use it and they would include it in the block, all the nodes in the network would refuse it because it's not part of the protocol yet. A green block just means we signal that we're in agreement with the activation of Taproot. And that's what the stage we're at right now is. So anybody wants to jump in on the mic, you're free to go. I have some questions about lot. So sure. Uh, three quick questions that kind of all relate to each other. Does the current latest version of Bitcoin Core default to lot equals false? If so, how does one upgrade to a lot equals true version? And is there a way of viewing the percentage of lot true versus lot false nodes? Very good question. So lot true, lot false. Uh, lot false really means uh, that we, uh, we, lot true means that we're doing a UASF. It means that at a certain point, my note by Gustavo, not anybody else's, my note, which has lot true, is whatever the miners say, whatever the other users say, my note is gonna consider the taproot as part of the protocol. That's gonna, that's what lot equals true means. It just becomes a fact for myself at some point without caring about anybody else. And that's what USF means. It means a bunch of users, hopefully the majority or a lot, at some point just say, Taproot is part of the protocol and that's it. Uh, so I just wanted to explain that. It is lot equals false right now. Uh, that's what the spree trial is. And so it's not a USF. It's first let's let the users try. Once August hits and let, excuse me, let the miners activate and we'll see. And once August hits, the Bitcoin core team has said, we can then uh, release one that is lot equals true. Because at that point, it, they, they, many agree, more people agree that a USF would be valid. 
those that are, let's say, reticent about going to USF directly and want to try it with the miners first, agree that eventually lot equals true could be part of Bitcoin Core or one of Bitcoin Core releases. Right now it isn't, it is false. And to change it, you don't go in the configuration file and change it. You have to recompile the software. You have to change the code and rebuild it. So it's a very technical process that non-developers, uh, yeah, it's, it's hard for non-developers, let's say. It's even hard for some developers. So and that's, uh, uh, I don't know if that answers your question, Nick. Uh, but yeah, yeah. So to recap, if, see if I've understood this correctly. We are, by default, the latest version of Bitcoin Core is a miner activated soft fork, uh, olive branch reaching out to the miners being like, let's do this together. By exactly. August, if it's worked, then we can all party. If it doesn't work and we're under 90%, then Bitcoin Core will very likely release a latest version with lot true which is a UASF client. And that will hopefully just nudge the miners into activating that last whatever 15, 20% that's left. But you that's will have to actively exactly. update your Bitcoin Core uh, version to the latest. And not everybody is doing that, right? People who have Umbrella or people who use MyNode, um, they can easily update. But many nodes do not. So there are probably nodes on the network right now who don't even have the lot false um, version. So I'm wondering, is there a way of viewing the versions of nodes that are currently running on the network to see which nodes are running an older version than even the lot false, which ones are, are running the latest lot false, and are there some that are running lot true today? Is that viewable? That's viewable if they are exposing it. So a node can just not expose itself to the network and like try to hide itself and just collect blocks and be like observant. Uh, a block that is a node that is more participant and let's say sharing blocks with someone else, you would you could probably get that information. I think I've saw Ben Carmen share that stat or someone or maybe looked at Junior. I think there's people that have been starting to share. Um, if I recall correctly, it was around 5% of users uh, that had activated Taproot. Uh, I don't know if you can see if they're signaling lot true or lot false. I just know that they were running Bitcoin Core Taproot ready software, um, probably as a lot false. But uh, you should probably look at look dash universe research uh, on uh, node um, observation, and you can probably find more information there, uh, either either on his Twitter or like on his website look dash junior. Uh, let me maybe get the URL for you. Can I chime in on that last one, Gustav? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Um, the, uh, the, we should be pretty wary about node counts um, because uh, they can easily be faked. This was something that happened back in 2016 when there was a big push for these uh, alternate clients or bigger blocks. Um, that you had instances of people spinning up like hundreds of nodes and like an AWS server and then having them all signal for uh, their preferred uh, client. So that's really not a metric that people should put much weight into. Um, and then the other thing I would say is that the offering minor signaling is not um, is not meant as an olive, olive branch. Um, it's just the safest way to update um, because uh, it makes uh, if all the miners are updated and ready to force new rules, um, that uh, reduces the chances of a, uh, any reorgs. Um, if you have a situation where like a chunk of miners aren't forcing the new rules yet, you might get them accidentally accepting invalid blocks. So I don't think it was meant as like a friendly thing for them. It's just uh, if it works, it's the safest upgrade path. I agree uh, in the technical part of it, but let's say in the social, it, it has some social implications. And I guess the worry comes more from that side, but ultimately, technically, I, I agree with you. It, it ob you obviously want, uh, as soon as Taproot begins, is activated, you want miners to be running it 
you you want them to accept the transactions that have that root. Else, it doesn't work. It it is true to a certain point that miners have a, a final say because they're the ones composing the blocks. Uh, but it it does come with social implications. The extent of those implications are obviously part of the debate. Uh, but uh, I think we we cannot at the same time. Uh, not consider them. We we might think it's 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 worth it. A lot of people do, and, and I respect that. Uh, I I'm not too worried. At the end of the day, I I, I do think it it can. It's a, it's not the it's 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 a pretty good strategy what it's being done right right now. Uh, but but I do see some potential risks of uh, you know it it does give a control, and since it has those social implications, the miners could decide as they did with Segwit to uh, delay the activation, to uh, play the ground. Uh, would you agree with uh, that part, Mario? Yeah, yeah, to be clear, I wasn't making, I wasn't trying to make an argument in favor of a uh, speedy trial. I was just kind of speaking to the, the motivations behind it. Um, it wasn't, the reason people want it is not, you know, to be friendly with the miners. The reason is just because it's uh, the more conservative, safe approach. Um, so yeah, I, I agree with everything else you said that, yeah, there are a bunch of social implications and. Yeah, people are worried about what happened last time. Great. Yeah, perfect. Uh, so, so someone, I'll oh, go ahead. Sorry, I had one more point. Um, the taproot.watch website gives you a nice um, visual of the current blocks that are signaling for taproot. And so if we think of how many difficulty cycles there are until August, it's like five or six. And we are already reaching about 33% signaling. Um, and just glancing at it, it seems to be maybe accelerating towards green. So at this point in time, it might be likely that we see a minor activated soft fork. It is very likely, of course. Uh, but don't forget that uh, a few months before the activation of SegWit, it was also that impression. Uh, and many ended up, uh, a miner can remove his signal. A miner can signal, uh, and two weeks later say, I, I don't, don't want to signal anymore. Uh, and and that's what, uh, that's a risk that can happen. And there can be many motivations associated with that. Uh, and so so I agree with you. I, I do think that it's going to work. But many told themselves that in the earlier phase of segment, and it didn't work. Well, it, it, I don't want to be, I, I want to be exact. Uh, Sequid was still minor activated uh, in a way with, uh, but it was minor, it was due, well, many think it was due to, it, this is still debatable, I think, uh, and it was, it coincides, uh, it, it just makes, it, it just happened after the USF movement, after users were gonna enforce it, miners were started signaling again. And they just, it, it was minor activated, but the USF part of it, the pressure of the users on the miners was clearly there. So many would say they only activated it due to that pressure. Uh, so maybe we can see something like that happen again, or maybe we can see, like you said, straight minor activation yeah very likely i'm gonna say it in the chat uh and not uh someone already said brendan already said bit notes.io those are the listening notes basically the notes that want to be seen uh there's another note count by look dash junior which honestly is i've never understood exactly how it works uh, I think it just sends messages to the nodes and tries to get a response from them. Uh, and then it, from that response, it knows the uh, a version they're running of Bitcoin. So I'll send that. But like Mario said, anybody can spin up 100,000 nodes on the cloud. So it doesn't mean they're real users. But still, it's an interesting data set. So Sam asks, Hi, Gustavo. You mentioned, mentioned some possible problems with Taproot. Can you give us an idea of what to look for? Honestly, I don't think it's much of our users to look for. 
in the problems mentioned. Um, it's more about developer implementation of Taproot within wallets um, and uh, also about like potential quantum computing risks or things like that. Uh, so nothing a user has to worry about and nothing about stealing coins or nothing like that. So the risks aren't at that level. It's just, let's say, a taproot transaction. Uh, you need all the, so basically let's say I'm making, I'm signing uh, a signature uh, with, uh, let's say me and Tristan have a UTXO each. Uh, and we want to send those two UTXOs to Mario. And we want to do it in the same transaction. Right now, I can just make a signature. Tristan can make a signature for his UTXO. And we can send those coins to Mario. Uh, and we really just need to make our signatures and share them. Like, I need to share my signature and my in the transaction template with Tristan. And he just broadcasts it to the network. And the transaction happens. And we can do that on basically many, many wallets. However, with Taproot, uh, you would, I would need to know each input of the UTXO of Tristan's. So basically, each precedent transactions Tristan made, he would need to know each, every precedent transaction I made um, so that we know uh, there's no, like, uh, there's no possible tentative of making me sign something that is not exactly what I thought it was. There's no deception possible. And that can be fixed uh, with like my wallet going to run, be running a node. If I run a node and I have the blockchain, well, I obviously have all his previous inputs corresponding to that UTXO. But uh, if I don't run a node, I would get more information about the transaction. From the network perspective, it can be less private because I'm requesting more information from a third party node. Uh, that's kind of a way to, to describe that issue that Ben Carmen uh, found. I'm going to send uh, his Twitter. He's posting a lot about um, taproots and research on it so you can follow him for like let's say those uh new pieces of information regarding taproot but it's mostly about developing walls correctly to protect from those risks or let's say running a node always faces that risk uh, but let's say it makes transactions more heavy in size uh, not not on the network but on let's say your your phone, mobile device, you, you need to download more data to compose the transaction. Uh, and that data, you need to request it either from your own node or from a third party. And uh, it can be a privacy risk to request it from a third party. That's basically one of the downsides I saw, but it's very detailed and doesn't concern, let's say, users, it quite it concerns developers. Um, OK, the point about quantum computing and tap is actually maybe a little bit outside my scope, but I still try to, to answer it. Um, basically, right now, uh, we have many transactions that their public key is known. Because when a public key hash, pay to public key hash transaction is redeemed, one has to expose the public key associated to that transaction. Uh, it's actually part of the ECDSA signature. I think I have it in another presentation. Yeah, you need to expose in the signature, uh, this is this ECDSA formula, you need to expose um, the public key in a way. And um, it just becomes known to the world. The public key. The public key doesn't allow you to steal the coins. That would be the private key. Um, but the public key, um, with quantum computing, could allow you to calculate that private key. But if you don't use address you use, which is very not advised to do, you should just use one address for one UTXO and switch to address. If you do that, you're safe. Uh, and honestly, it's a risk of like 10, 20 years. 
So there's, they can be network upgrades to protect everyone from it uh, and things like that. But a taproot is, and that's with like pay to public key hash. Pay to script hash doesn't have that issue because you never reveal uh, the, the public key associated with a private key. Uh, and if you don't do address reuse, you don't have that problem either. Taproot is, it uses the, the concept of a public key and a private key corresponding to that. So it kind of is like going back to that initial state of pay to public key hashes before the, the pay to script hash solution to that potential risk. But let's see, I was reading Peter Will talk about that. One of the best developers really not worried about that. Uh, very abstract issue that could happen decades from here or maybe never happen. Uh, and which probably either way requires an upgrade or a change or a solution. So yeah, okay, no problem. Uh, Xavier, anybody else? Any question, any meme, any latest news maybe that just happened during the presentation? Elton has a question. Let's say 90% of miners signal they want taproot. But what happens to the other 10% that still don't? The ones that signal no, they can still mine blocks that are taproot transactions since it's backwards compatible. Okay, so there's a few elements within that question. Let's start with the first one. What happens to the 10% that still don't? Um, well, taproot doesn't get activated as soon as 90% of, well, it does. It gets activated as soon as 90% of miners signal for two week, but it doesn't become a rule of the protocol right away. It just means it's gonna become a rule of the protocol soon. When is that soon? It can be like one month after, two months after, really the data set, um, I like the, there's gonna be a, a, a date set by the developers, let's say, in August, 90% signal, and end September, it's part of the protocol. Anybody can do a Bitcoin taproot transaction. So the 10% have lost uh, as soon as the 90% signal. They probably will upgrade their software to uh, do taproot and accept taproot transactions. So that's what's probably going to happen to them. They can rebel and say, like, no, we're never going to upgrade to taproot. Uh, but they're probably going to miss on a few blocks. Uh, they could probably try to make a chain and like have competing chains. One that is like non-taproot, we refuse to enforce taproot. But they're only the 10%. So they're going to, their chain is not going to go wrong. The, the main chain is going to be the taproot one. So that's kind of like the possibilities, but they're probably just going to upgrade their software within that one month to month period of uh, between the activation and the implementation. And, uh, but no, they cannot mine blocks that are taproot, that have taproot transactions if they haven't upgraded their software to uh, understand taproot transactions. Backwards compatible doesn't mean when with taproot and SegWit that your old version of Node understands taproot or SegWit transaction. It just means that a blocks that includes them is still considered valid, even if you don't understand those transactions. So that's the thing. People, a lot, some nodes still haven't upgraded to SegWit four years later, but they're still accepting blocks that have SegWit transactions. They're just not understanding them. And it's a risk for them because they're accepting blocks without being able to read through everything because they just, let's say they don't speak the SegWit language and they wouldn't speak the Taproot language. Um, so a miner couldn't mine a block with tra Taproot transactions without upgrading it. A node can accept a block with Taproot transactions without upgrading, but he cannot create Taproot transactions. Cool. 
I think we're gonna be over soon. So unless someone has a last question, a last comment, we will be over. Okay, it seems like we're basically done. So thanks everybody for showing up. Uh, I hope you learned something today and uh, share with me if uh, you like these meetups. Uh, if maybe you wanna talk about something else, me talk about something else, or uh, if anybody wants to do a presentation, that's part of the framework as well. So uh, thanks everybody. And uh, uh, okay, Henry has a question, I'll be answering that. Uh, does upgrading to Taproot automatically means you're updating to SegWit? It, it does, because unless you go on the code and of the Taproot version and you remove all the SegWit part, but you have to be a very skilled developer to do that, I think. So unless you're doing that, yes, it means, because the latest, the Taproot version of Bitcoin Core is going to include the previous SegWit, all the previous versions including SegWit, but technically you could upgrade to Taproot. Uh, actually, I don't think so, because like Mario sent on the chat before, a Taproot transaction follows uh, the same, the BEG32 encoding, the same type of encoding that a SegWit transaction has. So it shares probably a lot of code. So you could probably remove the SegWit part and keep the BEG32 encoding, like I said, you, you have to be a very skilled developer to do that. I, I don't think you can, actually. Uh, Taproot is a type of SegWit address. OK. That's good to know. OK, so there, there you go. You, you can't. Sam says, great presentations. Thank you so much. By the way, I was able to follow without trouble. Looking forward to the next one. Thanks again. Thanks uh, for the comments, Sam. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, and thank you, everybody. We'll be talking. Uh, I'll, I'll be doing a presentation in French next week. Similar subject, but probably the week after that, or in two, three weeks, we'll do other ones. Uh, and like I said, uh, we're looking for suggestions, so don't be shy. Uh, if you want to do one or you want to hear about something else. Take care, everybody. Have a great week.